All right, we're back. Kevin's Corner. Two weeks out from training camp starting. Uh, and, you know, very fittingly, we've gone to the bullpen this week. Eddie Garrison down on vacation, I believe, in Florida. Actually, Mark, I think he tweeted at you about a Bucky's, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, he did. I still have to get his full review. I haven't heard it yet. Yeah, I don't know if there's enough characters on Twitter for a full Bucky review. Bucky's review. But, yes, you've heard him on these airwaves before, certainly from a fan standpoint, but even on this podcast. He is Mark Dykton, the producer of Kevin and Quarry, each and every morning here, Monday through Friday on the fan and with all-star week here very fitting we go to the bullpen uh, mark thank you no problem pleasure to be here and i think if schedules work out i think we might do two pods this week next week i'm going to be out so i figure it was a good opportunity to you know two not super time sensitive pods of course you know we'll, we'll see about the topic that we're talking about today and how quickly things get moving on that but we'll focus today on the contract situations of jonathan taylor and michael pittman um, obviously both big news items entering training camp, potentially entering the final year of their respective rookie deals. I think in the Taylor's case, you've got a little bit more league wide intrigue with that. Um, so we'll focus on that today, but, uh, Mark, how you, uh, how you doing, man? I'm hanging in there, hanging in there, ready to get to football season, counting down the days till training camp, counting down the Sundays till we're watching football again. Can't wait for it to get here. How about your bears in town? Hell Point yeah. Praxis. Can't wait. Yeah, I've got my tickets to both training camp dates, so that should be fun. It'll be cool seeing uh, Justin Fields and Anthony Richardson across from each other competing and everything like that. So should be interesting. A lot of, lot of Indianapolis Colts ties on that Bears team, so it'll be a little bit of a reunion with Matt Eberflus and company coming to town. So should be fun. Now, I think I mentioned this on last week's podcast, but you know when I look at the training camp schedule for the Colts, just briefly before we get into, again, Taylor and Pittman situations, the Bears joint practices fall into this. Less practice days, I think it's 13 this year versus mm -hmm. 16 last year, but more on the weekends and more at night. Those Bears practices, 6 p.m., I know for you and I, Mark, it's not like the most pressing thing in the world from a time standpoint, but you know, if you are someone that's working like a real 9 to 5 and can't get out of that, uh, that is awesome, the fact that you were able to, you know, again, work a full day and then come up to Grand Park and catch your team in action. So 16th and 17th of August. And, Mark, you just went straight to the Colts website and got your free ticket, right? Uh-huh. Yep, loaded up on there. They're still available, so I'm sure they'll sell them until there's capacity or whatever. But, yeah, get them while you can and bring out the kids. You know, school probably starting for most kids, if if not already at that point. So bring out the family and enjoy a nice, like, late August summer. All right, let's get into these contract talks again. Jonathan Taylor and Michael Pittman. If you are a Chris Ballard slash Colts you know, whatever, follower, fan, however you want to describe it, you know, we get used to kind of late July into August. Sometimes it leads right up until the first regular season game. If you have outperformed your rookie contract, he will give you a second contract extension, um, again, right before the final year of your rookie deal. Um, you can go back to Shaquille Leonard. You can go back to Braden Smith. You can go back to, I think, Naheem Hines would fall into that category. Quentin Nelson last year was a little bit more close, really close, I think, to the start of the regular season. But, you know, in Ballard's history, um, he has been very, very adamant that if we draft you, you perform well, you're going to get to that second contract uh, before the end of your rookie deal. And so that's where you get Taylor and Pittman in their case. And they're both really, really entering case, uh, interesting case studies um, in both the regards. Let's start with Taylor. And I have an overarching theme with running backs, and I know listeners of this podcast are very familiar with it, of I don't draft running backs till day three. I, I just think the position is not valuable enough. Um, if you look at a guy like Jonathan Taylor and he were to have the same start to an NFL career and he would play any other position – we would not be sitting here debating his contract at all. It'd be an absolute no-brainer. You re-sign him, you give him pretty much whatever he wants, and you move on. Um, I think for the most part, people want to see him remain a cult, but there's question on years, there's question on value, those sorts of things. Uh, Mark, just overall, your opinion, just kind of value-wise on how you view Taylor in relation to the Colts, and maybe just running backs in this league. Well, there's no question that Jonathan Taylor has outplayed his contract with the Colts. I don't think anybody 
on the Colts can say that, yeah, he's he's underperformed. He's outranked, he outplayed his contract. He's currently 37th ranked on average annual salary for the running backs in the NFL. I don't think anyone would say that Jonathan Taylor is the 37th best anything when it comes to running backs. Uh, he deserves to get paid. Whether or not that's with the Colts, I don't know. We've talked about it ad nauseum that the Colts have a lot of premium contracts at non-premium positions. Right, right. And I love Jonathan Taylor a lot. I just don't know if I love them offering him yet another big money contract to a position that, I mean, you see it all over the league that there's running backs having arguments with their current teams about contract offers and whatnot. And Jonathan Taylor is one of the elite running backs in the league. I just, I, what he's going to command, I just, I don't know if I can justify it with the Colts. Yeah. And, and I, I think I'm here with it, Mark. As much as, again, I have the philosophy of you don't spend a valuable resource on a running back like that, I, I can understand a extension for Taylor in the two to three year range. I don't know if I can understand it much longer than that. And I say it with a bit of a reluctant tone. But it comes again back to the overall philosophy of drafting a running back in the you know middle part of round two. Whereas I brought this up before, hey Mark, when you look at Taylor and you look at Leonard and you look at Buckner and you look at Quentin Nelson, in some way, shape, or form, all four of those guys have been the best players at their respective positions. One of the best, if not the best, over the last few years. I mean, I don't think there's any debating. All, all, all four of them have been at an all-pro level at various points in their careers. And yet, where's that gotten you as a team? Yeah, You haven't won a division title in the lowly AFC South. You have one playoff win in the Ballard era. You picked fourth in the draft this year. Yeah, you just had a historically awful season for your franchise. So, if those guys are playing other positions of value. What if one's a corner? What if one? Hell, what if one's a tight end? What if one, obviously, quarterback would you know send it into a different stratosphere? But what if one is an offensive tackle? Like things like that. Now you're starting to get better return on your investment. So that's the argument. Um, but I, I'm not going to choose to kind of live in my stubborn mindset. I'm going to choose to live in reality. And the reality is this: It's July 10th. I do think the Jonathan Taylor Colts marriage will continue. The question is for how long, and what does that look like? I think it's really, really interesting when you look at running back values or uh, salaries in the NFL right now. Derrick Henry is at twelve and a half million. Mm-hmm. There are only two running backs above that annual salary in the NFL. They are Christian McCaffrey at sixteen and Alvin Kamara at fifteen. Mark, you obviously know this full well. Kamara and McCaffrey both are elite third down backs. Yep. They are guys that help you out. I mean, hell, they are hybrid running back and wide outs. Yeah. Can't and, even call them. And I would say that's why their contract yes. deems them to get paid what that is because they're such an they're such a threat in the passing game. And that's what a lot of running backs are seeing that hey, if I'm not a, if I'm not a threat in the passing game, I'm not going to get paid and on a team soon because that's just the way the NFL is moving to is that you have to be a running back that can be counted on on third down, not just to run the ball, but also to catch the ball as well. And again, I bring that up, Mark, because, okay, what does that mean for Taylor? Mm -hmm. I mean, Taylor's not a guy that really impacts the game from a third down standpoint. I mean, he certainly made plays in the passing game. I don't think he's, you know, a a huge liability, but there were moments last season where I was like, man, Taylor from a blocking standpoint is not really helping you out here. So um, I think that'll be something to keep an eye on, just again, from an annual value standpoint. Obviously, the guaranteed money will be huge. And then length. You know, when you get in the Dalvin Cook thing right now, with Minnesota bailing with two years to go, how deep do you want to go with Taylor? I mean, he is 24 years old. He's pristine off the field. There's no major injuries. Um, yes, you have the ankle issue that caused him to miss this past spring and miss some time last season, but it's not like there's an Achilles or an ACL in his background. You know, I think both sides can look at it with a little bit of leverage and say, hey, all that wear and tear at Wisconsin is going to start to pile up. Um, or, you know, Taylor's camp would say, look, my client has been extremely durable throughout his career. So um, I think in the two to three year extension range, if again, if I'm factoring in realistic nature, that's where I'm at. I wouldn't mind him playing out this rookie deal, him be even playing on the franchise tag. But that is me talking. I don't think that's how the Colts are going to handle it. I think of it as something in the three year extension that 
makes sense. Still put him at 27 years of age when that contract would run out, so he'd still be under 30. He'd be on the right side of under 30. I the guaranteed money is going to be very interesting. Yeah. That, that's the way the NFL contracts are working. It's not so much the the length these days. It's how much guaranteed up front is he getting, and I think that's where that's where the key cog of this whole contract is going to come from, is how much guaranteed money is he looking for and how much are the Colts willing to offer because if they're at a big disagreement and this pushes into training camp, which by all signs it looks like it's going to, if things aren't going well, it's going to be curious if Jonathan Taylor starts kind of, you know, vocalizing his displeasure a little more than what we're used to. Which And for Taylor's camp, Mark, he was pretty vocal back in June. You know? Yeah, and that was uncharacteristic for him. So I can't imagine Barry. that if things are going poorly and he, they're just completely on two separate sides of this contract negotiation, that his camp is revving up, that he's not a little more ticked off and kind of starts vocalizing his displeasure with it. Yeah, and... I do think, again, this is going to get done. I, I think if you were going to make me pick right now, hey, is it more likely he gets it done or Pittman gets it done before the start of camp, I'd probably actually say Taylor, certainly before the start of the season. I would agree. Um, because I, I do think, again, the Colts are huge, huge fans of Jonathan Taylor. Um, so, again, still something just to continue to monitor and keep eyes on. Uh, but that'll be very interesting as the Colts get set for camp here. In about two weeks, um, I think the last thing on on Taylor is this: you can't ignore the presence of Anthony Richardson. You can't ignore the presence of an offense that's just void of a lot of serious talent at the skill positions. And that's the problem. Uh, well, not the problem, but that's that's the issue with Jonathan Taylor is that he's so talented on a team that's got no talent on right. the offense that he's such a bright light on that offense that if you take him away, you're like, what does this offense look like? What will it look like if he's not on this team? It's great leverage for his, his Exactly. Agent. That's why that contract is going to be so complicated to try to figure out because he's such a key cog of that offense and what they bring to the table that on a lot of other teams it wouldn't be an issue. On this Colts team, when there's such a dearth of talent on the offensive side, it's just going to be really interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, and obviously it's something that a huge kind of counter to, hey, you let Taylor walk, let let Pittman walk, which I, I know there's not maybe a ton of people that are in both of those camps, but you certainly hear some of that chatter. Who else are you going to pay? And right. how else are you going to use that that money? I do think that is relevant, and again, that's why I'm choosing not to live in this like stubborn mindset about running backs and choose to live in a reality mindset of, okay, this is where the Colts are at right now, and it's not like they're paying Richardson anytime soon or Bernard Ryman anytime soon or Quiddy Pay anytime soon. So given that... The two- to three-year extension makes sense with Taylor. Uh, let's shift gears to Michael Pittman. And, you know, this one is a little bit more complicated, Mark, and I feel like we get into the label very often of, okay, who and what qualifies as a number one wideout. You know, if you want to look at Pittman's numbers, um, he would rank, I think it's like 23rd or 24th in receiving yards combined over the last two seasons. Um if I'm in the Michael Pittman camp and I'm starting to get pushback from the Colts, I'm like, yeah, your guy's not a legit number one wideout. I would say, um, show me how you guys have reacted to your quarterbacks over the last couple of years. Uh, what did you do with Matt Ryan? What did you do with Carson Wentz? Okay, that tells me everything I need to know about what you have thought about the guys throwing to my client. Uh, I would be okay with paying Michael Pittman a decent number one whiteout like contract money. A little bit is desperation. A little bit is I think you're backed into a corner in that you have to support Anthony Richardson at all costs, particularly at the pass catching positions. And again, I do think there's more with Pittman if you have better and more stable quarterback play. So by no means am I saying he has, you know, deserves or is at a top ten whiteout type contract. But I think there's an element of when guys reach the second contracts or potentially reach free agency, you either pay or you don't see the guy. Mm -hmm. And I am of the thinking of you're desperate, you need to pay. Uh, your thoughts on Michael Pittman? I, I don't think this is just a little bit more complicated than Jonathan Taylor's contract. I think this is a lot more complicated because he's a number one on a team that on most other teams, he'd probably be a number two. He's going to want to get paid as a number one. The Colts are going to either have to pay him out of necessity or desperation, as you said. I, I feel like there's a lot of unproven potential there still, and that's that's in part because of who's been throwing him the football, where you can't really make sense of was Carson Wentz, you know, 
the cop is he doing a good job here? Is this Michael Pittman? What's going on, Matt Ryan? Like, there's so much unproven talent, but Michael Pittman is for sure the number one wide receiver on this Colts team. Whether he's played like one, whether you think he is one, that's a whole different conversation. I'm going to be very curious to see how those contract negotiations go because he's going to say, I'm number one on this team, you know, and the Colts are, the Colts are going to say, Yeah, that's true. Have you played like a number one? All 17 games, yeah, this and that. Like, there's going to be a lot of conversation and probably a lot of hurt feelings, I think. And I also think this is going to be between Jonathan Taylor and Michael Pittman. One of these guys is going to end up pissed off because I think the Colts are going to unveil the franchise tag on one of them. Really? That they haven't done since Pat That'll McAfee. be wild to see. I think that's going to happen because it's just going to either be contracts are stalling, we're not getting them, but we don't want to lose them for nothing, so here's yeah. the franchise tag. I can totally see that happening with Michael Pittman Jr. That you know They haven't used them since McAfee in, in 2013, so it's been you know eons since they have last used it. You know The thing about wideouts on the move, and Mark, you are a Bears fan, so you obviously see the Bears trying to build a, a, a wideout group for their young quarterback. You know, when you look at the price tag for Tyreek Hill, you look at the price tag for Devontae Adams, you know, you see that AJ Brown and, and what's happened to the Titans, that trade. You know, for the most part, those types of guys don't get moved. And when they do get moved, it's for trade packages that are just astronomical mm-hmm. in what they look like. And I think in a guy like Pittman, you have a pretty durable guy. I think he is a, and I've said this again a million times, he is not a USC pretty boy playing a position that we often label as pretty boy. Like, I like the style that he brings. I like how he works. I think those things matter when you're talking about a relationship with a young quarterback and what you're trying to build there. There is, you know, when Peyton Manning walked in, you had Marvin Harrison and some other wideouts. When Andrew Luck walked in, you had Reggie Wayne. You don't have that right now for Anthony Richardson. So if you're all of a sudden going to let Michael Pittman walk, you're saying, hey, Right now, what we've seen out of of Alec Pierce is kind of a one-route guy, maybe a two-route guy. Hey, uh, everything now is in your basket. Or, hey, Josh Downs, we need you to be a whole lot more than just a slot wideout. That's too much pressure that I think you would be putting on those guys. I understand that the college game continues to produce <coughs> wideouts on a pretty high level. But again, I think you want to have a veteran that has been there and has done it for a couple of years and it's not like it's a slam dunk that you draft these wideouts and they automatically turn into something. So I think Pittman is going to have the most pushback if and when he does sign that second contract because I think the value, when you start to compare it to other wideouts, it's going to be like, what? Like, how? You know, like, he does not deserve that, this and that, and there will be reason for that, but... I think you've got to provide context around Pittman's situation and realize the quarterback issues that have been in this building um, that have, I think, limited him, and then the other side of that obviously being support for Anthony Richardson. The franchise top, tag, the, the, the top, is, I'm sorry, the top 15 running back or wide receivers in the NFL right now, $18 million or more average annually salary. Say that again. The top 15 are making at least $18 million a year. That's from Tyreek Hill, who's making 30. Where's the 20 cutoff at? The 20 is at Mike Williams on the Chargers. And how many guys fall into that 20 or 30? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so 13 guys are at least 20 million. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look at Pittman's numbers, he is the 23rd, 24th. It's right there in terms of receiving yards over the last two years. And your quarterback play has been awful in that time frame. So if you have competent quarterback play, is he 15th? Is he 14th? Then would you feel better about giving him $20 million a year? And, and we know how that works. You know, when you give a guy $20 million a year, by year whatever, three or four, of that um, contract extension, you're now, you know, in kind of the middle of the pack, sort of wide out money as well. So, um, I mean, there's names on here that- I would not put Michael Pittman. If you gave me the choice, I'm not putting Michael Pittman above a few of these guys. And even when you get outside of the Mike Williams contract, I mean Deontay Johnson, Christian Kirk, Tyler Lockett, Mike Evans, right outside there. Those are those are some tough decisions right there. Yeah, and trust me, I think there are a lot of people that will look at this and just be totally disgruntled, disappointed. I think it falls into a little bit of the Taylor camp of who else are you going to pay? It's not like these guys hit the open market very often. And I think the biggest and I will say this for several off seasons to come, the biggest 
goal that has to be achieved on an annual basis with your roster building is how are you supporting your quarterback? And you've got to do it at all costs, especially when the passing element to his game is one of the bigger question marks with his game is you cannot skimp. You cannot skimp there whatsoever. So I would be okay with paying Pittman that sort of money while continuing to try and bolster an ad there. Um, last thing I will say on this, and Mark, feel free to chime in if you've got anything else to add. Mm-hmm. Again, the Colts will open up camp here uh, two weeks from Wednesday. We are recording this on July 10th. That will be the first practice day. Um, I have seen deals signed you know, in the first couple of days leading into camp. I have seen deals signed at various points of camp, uh, You know, maybe right before the start of the regular season, kind of that Friday or Saturday before the opener. Um, if I had to guess, I think eventually the Colts will get extensions with both of these guys done. If you made me pick which one gets done first, I would say Taylor. Maybe Taylor's more dependent on a Dalvin Cook or a Saquon Barkley situation. So maybe we'll have to wait on that. But I do think I say this with a lot less confidence in the timeliness of these deals getting done than I had with Nelson or Leonard or Smith. Like those deals, it was like, yep, you know that they're going to get done. It'll happen, you know, before the start of the season. To your point earlier, I I don't have as much confidence in being like, Taylor's a thousand percent getting done before the start of the year and the same as Pittman. Mm-hmm. What were you saying about franchise tag, by the way? Before I cut you off earlier, I apologize. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on the franchise tag well, situation. Well, it's, it's been so foreign to this franchise, and I feel like it's kind of foreign to – I think Chris Ballard falls into a little bit of a – he knows it's bad business. He knows it pisses mm-hmm. off the player. And I think Ballard is really, really mindful of that and doesn't want to do that. Um, so that's where I was just a little surprised by it, more because the Colts have not had a recent precedent – of doing that again, McAfee, 2013. Yeah. Now, granted, McAfee's very vocal, and him and Ryan Grigson's r- relationship, yeah, to call it icy, would be a compliment. Um, so that's where probably a little bit of my surprise came from. On that. yeah, I, I just think that both of these contracts are so complicated, and you can go either way with both of these guys. That <laughs> it might be like, you know what, best interest. We're just gonna give this guy money now, and we'll figure out yours later. Here's the franchise tag. You're still gonna get. You know, pretty pretty handsome payout, but we'll work out this negotiation a little longer. Yeah, it's something I think that, you know, if we get into the season and, you know, Pittman strikes me as a guy that I think he does want to be here. I don't think it's like any sort of like issues with uh, Indiana or this market. Um, you know, they're starting a family here, all of those things. Like, but he also, you know, okay, could he be a guy that would want to explore what Frank has to offer? And, you know, when you look at wide receiver money, I mean, hell, even the Christian Kirks of the world, that was a name that you, that you brought up. I mean, mm-hmm. look what he had. And he got, um, after, I would say, a little bit of a just kind of underwhelming few, first few years with the Arizona Cardinals. So it wouldn't stun me if either of them, particularly Pittman, fell into the you're playing out your rookie contract. But again, that is against the norm for how the Colts have typically operated. Uh, with that, Mark, should we get into some Twitter questions? Let's do it. All right, uh, lead us off there. All right, K. Tao says, Hey, Kevin, Jonathan Taylor did his best running with Jack Jack Doyle blocking on the field. All I'm seeing in the current tight end room are pass catchers. Who do you think sees stepping up in Jack's shoes? Yeah, K. Tao, it's a great question. You know, when they drafted Will Mallory out of Miami, and again, we didn't see Will really at all in the spring due to a foot injury, the initial thought was, okay, here comes a tight end. But I had a specific skill set for, I thought, what the tight end pick should have been. Similar to Josh Downs in that slot role, I thought the tight end should have been more of a blocker first. Not the case with Mallory. Um, you know, it's like, oh, fastest you know 40-yard dash time at the at the combine for any tight end, which you know fell in line with so many of those other athletic traits from the Colts draft class. But, you know, this question is kind of why you probably keep Mo Ali cox It's why you went out there and signed a guy like Pharaoh Brown in free agency of guys that probably fall a little bit more into the blocking category of things first. Um, And why I think Jack Doyle was such an important key cog for the Colts for several years was because when he walked into a huddle, you're not tipping your hand. And I think that is the goal at the tight end position oftentimes. It's can you be versatile, versatile, can you be multiple with that position group to where you're not tipping your hand. So, um, I think that is a question that remains to be seen of what the tight end group looks like from an inline blocking standpoint. Because I thought there were several times last season where 
plays just kind of busted due to that area of the field, that area of the offense not helping you. And oftentimes, it's that type of block that can be the difference between Jonathan Taylor going four and going 40. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a really relevant question for this year. Yeah, tight end position is going to be one of one of the big you know question marks heading into the off- offensive season is how can this tight end group react and work with Anthony Richardson, especially if he starts rolling out of the pocket and how do they adjust with that. So it'll be pretty interesting to see how that works. Uh, Jason says, we've seen more and more players make immediate high-level impacts as rookies. This is, is especially true of positions where that didn't used to be the case, such as quarterback, wide receiver, and left tackle. Do you think the NFL would make any changes to the three-year college rule for draft eligibility? Hmm. I, uh, this is an interesting question. I, Mark, I can't say I've really thought like too much about this. Like, um, Selfishly, at least I... I hope not. I, I really enjoyed the fact that college football, you do get them you know, for three years there. Um, I do think the leagues, for the most part, and I guess calling college football a league, I don't know, maybe that is accurate in today's day and age, but I do feel like there's like good relationships with the two. I mean, massive brands in college football, huge stadiums, and then let's just not ignore like the puberty <laughs> aspect to it all. Like. I mean, the physical development of bodies. I mean, yes, there are some really gifted high school senior football players. They don't look like, hell, they don't look like 20-year-olds that have spent, you know, a year and a half in a college weight room or a year and a half in a, in a nutritional program. Imagine staring across a DeForest book. <laughs> like, that's a grown-ass man across the way from me. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I don't think we're there yet with college. You know, with some of these NBA guys that are coming one and done, you know, oftentimes they are going to some sort of prep school or some sort of, you know, where they do get a little bit more professional focus. But even then, you, you're still waiting on body types to develop a little bit more in the NBA. You know, with college, with high school football at least, it's not like these guys are going to academies, quote unquote, where, you know, they are they are playing against pros or anything like that. So I, I would say no. And I, and I hope that I'm right with that. I don't know, Mark. Could you see any shortening of this? No, I would. I would agree that that the three year thing not only is it good for college, but it's good for the NFL. You can get some names established and then get them excited. Kind of work hand in hand, uh, college and the NFL. Where hey, get excited! Like I'm seeing Dane Brugler already putting out his 2024 mock draft, and there's Drake May and That's all those point. other guys. Yeah. That, hey, these are names to keep an eye on heading into the college football season. And then for you NFL fans, keep an eye out because if your team stinks, you might want to be you know ear to the ground on who these guys are going to be this year. So that is a good point. I totally don't see that changing. I think they've got a good thing going. And you see all the you see the ratings for the NFL draft, for God's sake. You see how many people are watching to see who goes where. I, I can't imagine that changes. Yeah. I, you know, the NBA draft, and again, we follow it super closely, but, you know, to the common sports fan, Mark, no one had heard of Scoot Henderson until two weeks ago. No. You know, and, and most people haven't seen him play. Right. And so you obviously don't get that in college football where it's like, Yes, Anthony Richardson, a little bit of an outlier, but still, SEC fans certainly knew who he was, and you know, Levin. I mean, all these quarterbacks are obviously playing and and playing in in, in a prime uh, time slot, and that's that's the case for ninety five percent of those picks. All right, Heavy Horseshoe says, "I'm a Colts fan in Central New York. I've never been to Indianapolis. I'm planning a trip for a Colts game, hopefully this season." What are some must-dos in, in, in Indy? I have a five-year-old, three-year-old, and a stepdaughter who's fourteen. Thanks in advance. This now was this the perfect time to have Mark Dykeman <laughs> slide in here? Uh, let's start here, Mark, for our listening audience that does not know. You have three girls, and their ages are six, four, and two. Okay, so fourteen. Neither of us are there. I not am a yet. three-year-old with Rosie, and then a uh, actually Max is what ten months today, ten months yesterday. Oh. So approaching one there. I, I'll start here, Mark, and I, I think the fourteen-year-old would still enjoy it. I think the Children's Museum is Boom. an absolute must. You read my mind. Yeah, we just had our in-laws in, uh, my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and their two kids. Uh, their kids are about five and seven, but they they absolutely loved the Children's Museum. They thought it was incredible. They had a great time. They have the sports, outdoor sports experience. Which, which is, is honestly maybe more fun for the adult than than oh, anybody yeah. else. Yeah, and then now they have the Minecraft, uh, the Minecraft exhibit. Uh, the kids love that. I'm not a huge Minecraft. I don't know what Minecraft right. is. I don't know how you play it. They were absolutely loving it. There's a ton to do there. Dinosaurs, all kinds of stuff. The Children's Museum is an absolute must-do. Uh, that's great for and all full ages. full day. 
Yeah. I mean, if uh-huh. you want to check off all the boxes there, and I would I would look up, you know, depending on when you're coming in, September, October, November, I don't know, you know, when during the season. But they have, you know, exhibits that travel in and out. So you, you want to make sure. Make sure you get an idea of that. I would go there. Uh, Mark, anything else that jumps out at you immediately? Yeah, I would say if you're coming, especially in the fall, keep that out for the Pacers schedule. See mm-hmm. see what's going on. Get to yep. a Pacers game. See the new look Pacers yep. and all that stuff. That's always a fun atmosphere. See if Boomer. it's September, you could do Indians. Yeah. 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 You can see, right see Rowdy, see Boomer, do the whole thing. Get a beer bat in the outfield. Do, <laughs> do the whole thing. Plenty to do. I, I, I'll say this, and I don't like, I, this isn't just like, disparage the Indianapolis Zoo by any means because I think it's a great zoo but I you know I feel like every city's like we have the greatest zoo in the world I think the zoo is fine and trust me I enjoy going there but if you are looking at like must-haves I I don't know if I would say the zoo I don't Mm -hmm. know maybe Central New York I I don't know what your zoo situation is up there maybe it it, your zoo uh whatever world isn't isn't like ours so maybe that would be a little bit more enticing to you I'll be curious to see what uh, Monument Circle looks like here in a few months, Mark. But right now, that AstroTurf feel to it, a little bit more yeah. of a walkability. And Monument Circle, for those unfamiliar, downtown, our center, our, you know, whatever, coordinates zero, zero, if you will. It's about a you know seven to ten minute walk from the circle to where Lucas Oil Stadium is. Uh, but I think that would be fun just from a walkability standpoint. Sometimes they've got some activities there for some y- younger kids as well. So I would say check that out around the weekends that you're there. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want this podcast to become zoo blasphemy, but I would agree that the Indianapolis Zoo leaves a little bit to be desired. Yeah, uh, with the lo- there's it's a, not the, San Diego. It ain't you know it ain't no St. Louis. St. St. Louis is a great zoo and all that stuff. But there's other options. I also say the garage is a great place yeah. to get a bike to eat. Lots mm-hmm. of stuff to do. Go you know play some bowling. There's arcade games. There's all kinds of stuff for kids to do as well. Enjoy that area. That is a very fun hangout spot for the Dyketon household when we when we get out there. Perfect for the kids to run around too. Uh-huh. Like five and three year old can run around there. You've got a little like shopping as well. Uh, so that is a great area. And I enjoy the um Penn's mechanical, is that yeah. across uh-huh. the bowling yep. area uh, as well. So that could be fun, especially on a nice Saturday afternoon. I'm Get so some sub zero ice cream if you're in the mood as well. Yeah. Do the whole thing. TV's over there for college football. So mm-hmm. yeah. Nice. Well, enjoy Indy when you come, Heavy Horseshoe. There's plenty to do here. There is. There is. Children's Museum of Must. Yes, 100%. Top, number one in the power rankings. Uh, Conroy says, if we're sellers later this upcoming season, I fear we may be, Ooh. who do you think is the most likely to be traded for the best yield and compensation? I'm not talking about the relatively unknown guys, by the way. Well, I can't imagine the unknown guys would be get, getting much compensation in the first place. Yeah. And, and, you know, Mark, when you hear the term sellers in the NFL, it, I don't think anyone's ever truly selling. You know, I mean, what did the Colts do at the trade deadline this year when the season was literally off the rails? Yeah, Naheem Hines to Buffalo. You know, and and what did that net you? You know, it's just, you know, Gilmore, I don't know. Could you got a fourth for him? I I think when you see this, what would jump out to me would be contract year guys. And I don't know, maybe Grover Stewart will, will get a contract extension before the start of the season. You know, but, you know, I'm trying to think of the free agents. I think Kenny Moore, Grover, Julian Blackman. Again, I don't. I mean, what what are those guys netting you? I mean, no one on the roster right now stands out as obvious as like Gilmore would have like this time last year of like older guy that you're surprised he's here if the season goes poorly, he plays a premium position, boom. I mean, you know, if you're gonna net crazy value, it's 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 Buckner or it's Quentin El- you know, it's something of right. that ill. It is a big name guy at that point. Yeah, you, you I have just to can't go see- on that. Chris Ballard doing that because I think he still views those guys as building blocks for for Anthony Richardson or alongside Anthony Richardson. So, yeah, outside of a Kenny Moore, outside of a you know Julian Blackman, again, what are they getting you in return? No one really jumps out at me. Yeah, I mean, unrestricted free agents in 2024 for the Colts. You've got Grover Stewart, Kenny Moore, Tavin Bryan. Gardner Minshew, Rigoberto Sanchez, Michael Pittman Jr., Tyquan Lewis, Jonathan Taylor, Tony Brown, Isaiah McKenzie, Luke Rhodes, Rashard Perryman, Julian Blackman, and the list goes on and on. I mean, not not a lot of name recognition once we keep moving down that list. And you know, when you say Pittman, I'm like, is Pittman Chase no. Claypool? Like, I, I I don't I don't think he is. Again, I, I think he'll be here moving forward. I guess things would have to really derail in your opinion on him. For that to change, because I think the Colts think very, very highly of Michael Pittman. I think the Colts scoff a little bit more at the, you know, people that are like, he's not a number one. You don't resign him. I, I don't think the Colts kind of fall. I mean, looking point. at that list, if I'm if I'm picking a guy that could get traded, Kenny Moore is at the top of that list of, of who could be on a trade right. block, new new place, maybe get a, a re-energization 
re-energized at a new place. That's easy for me to say. But it could be a trade deadline piece. I don't think the compensation is going to wow any Colts fans. I think we'd be looking at a middle-tier round draft pick, if that, for it. So it's one of those things where it's not like you're getting a first-round pick or anything in return. You're going to get, like, third, fourth, more likely fifth-round pick for something like that. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really good point. And, you know, this is probably an exercise we'll do on – on our second podcast together coming up later in the week, Mark. But, you know, if you start to get into the most indispensable Colts, which, you know, is kind of an annual thing that we do each July, it's kind of funny how, and I'm in the early stages of looking into this, but where Kenny Moore would rank on such a list. I mean, he was, in my opinion, your most disappointing Colt last season. And if you really think about most indispensable, you'd probably rank Kenny Moore pretty high. Right. And it's wild how he you know, should be viewed and is viewed externally, internally, et cetera, et cetera. And then to your point, how he's going to play out after such a disappointing uh, last season for him. So I think uh, he's still got some cachet around the league. People see, you know, the Pro Bowl selection and all that stuff, and he's at a premium position. Play he's slot. still, still under yeah. 30 years old. So I could see that at the deadline, if things aren't going well for the Colts and, and if they don't think they're going to re-sign him, that they could they could move him at some point and get yeah. get a, dra- a late drown draft pick in, in return for him. I feel like this last one Scotty Johnston submitted uh, because this is a paragraph long question. Okay. Scotty is our historian here in the building from a sports standpoint. His Jeopardy questions tend to be multiple paragraphs. Yeah, yeah. So buckle up, kids. Uh, enjoy the fire. <laughs> here we go. Wake Spike says after all the importance being made about betting and quote integrity of the game and how betting violates it. Yet, shouldn't they have just as strictly a policy with PEDs? Players are literally taking something to help alter their chances of winning. The financial component is also there with performance bonuses. I know the list of substances is long and, quote, they don't know, but that is the same excuse we got for gambling. It's also hard to believe that just because few players got caught, there aren't others using proxies to make their bets. What do you think the suspensions are so much different when they both affect game integrity? Interesting. Um... I I do think that the PED suspensions are significant. I, I, I think there's a lot of good points. I, I guess you start off by saying with that question. But I, I feel like it's still pretty strict. And, and, you know, we just saw Cam Robinson of the uh, Jags, you know, get busted for four games. You know, I think second offense is a year. Um, you know, I the gambling aspect of it, I feel like, there is a way to kind of get away with it if you want to. Like, if, you know, let's say Mark Dyke can play in the NFL and I was his buddy. I mean, Mark could literally just text me and I could make all the bets for him and then Venmo him that money. Obviously, PEDs, it's not like I could take the PEDs for Mark and then, or, you know, whatever. Maybe I'm taking mm-hmm. the taking the Wizenator test uh, to get around that. So, um, I would say the gambling is maybe a little bit more of, a harsher punishment. I don't think it's a massively harsher punishment than the PEDs. You got any thoughts on this, Mark? I, I don't I don't have a great, great answer for yeah, it. Yeah, I think PEDs is more of a single person is doing something to their body to try to manipulate, you know, their performance. Whereas if you're gambling on a game, you're not only gambling on yourself as an individual, you're gambling on a whole team or result. That I think could, you know, obviously affect the integrity of the game. While yes, PEDs do have an integrity uh, component to them, I don't think anybody's ever really viewed a PED suspension in the NFL the way they have for like baseball. Like when Brian Cushing got pinched with the Texans years ago, people weren't like, "Oh, Brian Cushing, ban him Brian out of the Cushing. league, what do this name. and that." Yeah, like I just remember that was one of the more notable ones because it was just like, "Oh, that's a name that I know" and everything like that. But yeah, I. I it kind of went under the radar. Like he returned, he played, he had a decent career and, and all that stuff. So it was kind of like swept under the rug. It wasn't that big a deal. It's like, oh yeah, PDs in football. Okay, fine. But if you're, especially with the NFL, how in bed they are with these sport books these days, like the Isaiah Rogers thing, all, uh, that whole situation. Like if you start, if, if, if gamblers across the country start believing that their bets are not valid yeah. or that there are some questions about that, that can bring a whole bunch of litigation and issues and headaches for the NFL and the sports book they're involved with. And that's why I think you're seeing these stiffer penalties because they don't want to have any sort of issue with the integrity of gambling wagers, wagers with their fans and, and the people that put their hard-earned money down 
on these Sunday games. Yeah, I think it's more of a slippery slope. Yeah. The gambling aspect to it all. And so I think that's where you would have some concern to it. And by no means am I condoning performance-enhancing drugs, and I do think the punishment should be where they're at. But there is an element, and this sounds like I'm defending Barry Bonds, of like, it's not like the steroids swung the bat. You know, just because mm-hmm. you're taking a performance enhancing drug, it doesn't automatically make you a better football player. You know, there might be side effects from that, or the, all of a sudden, from a technique standpoint, like you might have to do some things differently than your body is is used to. Like, it, it, it's not a guarantee. Whereas, if you are gambling and you are literally, you know, doing things on purpose or informing people what is, you know, going to happen or who's available or those sorts of things, that I think has a little bit more direct impact into the what we love about the NFL. And that, I think, is um, the innate ability to just have such a unknown to it week in and week out and the parody that drives that league and all those things. So I could be dead wrong on that. I, I There there yeah. might be some people, and I think Wake Spike's question offers this tone of you know, clearly thinking that PEDs deserve to have a little bit of a harsher, maybe even more of a harsher punishment there. But I just think gambling involves a little bit more of a slippery slope. Yeah, I just think especially – it's it's more fresh in everyone's minds. This whole gambling on sports and sports books are popping up at Great American Ballpark and everything like that. So the tie-in with gambling and sports is what we you know used to be like a no-no discussion is all of a sudden front and center. Yeah. So all of a sudden you don't want to have any integrity questions you know come up and everything and the Isaiah Rogers situation and the the uh, Calvin Ridley situation last year. You're like, oh, that could be mm-hmm. that, that's something the NFL wants zero zero zero, zero part in. Zero, zero, zero. Awesome. Um, that wraps up everything, right, Mark? Yeah, that our final that's it. Question? That was the last Twitter question. Cool. Uh, he is Mark Dykes, and I'm Kevin Bowen. Thank you for tuning into Kevin's Corner. We'll probably be back again later this week. Nothing super time sensitive, but want to make sure you continue to get your uh, pod fix in before training camp opens up two weeks from Wednesday. Um, so the focus here, of course, Jonathan Taylor, Michael Pittman related. Get into more indispensable Colts coming up later in the week. So everybody have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to Kevin's Corner. Thank you for Mark Dykton coming out of the bullpen. Again, fittingly with MLB All-Star Week here. Mark Dykton with Mark Dykton with an All-Star type effort for us on Kevin's Corner. And we will chat with you later in the week.